Betty, you can start now. Thank you. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us live. And to those listening in afterwards also, I also would like to warmly welcome our guests today, whom I'll shortly introduce to you. My name is Dr. Betty Cha. I am an Associate Professor and Researcher in Pharmacy Practice at the University of Sydney. I am a Fellow of the FIP and I chair the FIP Ethics Advisory Group. And this is my co-chair, Dr. Carl Schneider, who will introduce himself as well. Uh, good morning, uh, good evening to everywhere you are in the world. My name is Dr. Carl Schneider. I'm also a fellow of FIP. Uh, I have the pleasure of being an associate professor uh, alongside Betty at the University of Sydney, and I'm the secretary of the academic pharmacy section. I would like to remind all participants uh, that this webinar is being recorded and live streamed via YouTube. The recording will be available on our website at www.events.fip.org. You may ask questions using the question box provided and we will be answering these questions after the presentations. You are welcome to provide feedback uh, using the address listed there. And please become a member of FIP if you are yet to do so uh, by the link www.fip.org slash membership registration. So FIP's vision is a world where everyone benefits from access to safe, effective, quality and affordable medicines and health technologies. Our mission is to support global health by enabling the advancement of pharmaceutical practice, sciences, and education. We're very pleased um, on this occasion to be delivering this event uh, entitled Ethics of Sustainable Healthcare. There's been a, a recent increase in awareness within the pharmacy profession to practice in an environmentally sustainable manner. This is coupled with the emergence of concern with respect to climate change. However, sustainability is more than environmental consciousness. Sustainable development requires consideration of all three pillars of sustainability, social, economic, and environmental. These give rise to ethical concerns with respect to universal access and equality in the provision of healthcare. So today we will explore these issues in the following uh, talks. We will have a talk on what is sustainability anyway, and, and it will be an introduction to the three pillars of sustain, sustainable healthcare. We will be talking about thinking beyond the patient. What is the pharmacy's profession's duty of care to the wider population and the planet? Law and ethics in progressive environmental sustainability in pharmacy. Uh, insights from a bibliometric review. We will then have about 20 minutes of questions and answers with the panel, and we will then close. So to start, oh, the learning objectives for um, this session are to gain an understanding of social, economic, and environmental sustainability, to appreciate the ethical implications of increasing healthcare expenditure, explore the teaching methodologies to increase awareness about ethical aspects of sustainability, and develop your own opinion on the matter of sustainable healthcare. So to start our session today, we are going to be listening to our guest speaker, Dr. Cicely Roche. Dr. Cicely Roche, sorry, I'm, is an associate professor 
um, in the practice of pharmacy and fellow in education of sustainable, sustainable development at Trinity College, Dublin, Ireland. She is a member of the Ethics Advisory Group. Her key interests are in the areas of ethics and professional reasoning, higher education curriculum design and program focused approaches to assessment. Cicely is past president of the Pharmaceutical Society of Ireland, chair of the PSI Fitness to Practice Committee and founding member of the Pharmacy Law and Ethics Association in Ireland. She joined the university's Education for Sustainable Development in May of 2023. And she will now share her valuable expertise in a lecture entitled, What is Sustainability Anyway? An introduction to the three pillars of sustainability. I invite Dr. Cicely to share her screen and start. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. I am hoping that you all have a view now of the presentation. Um, and thank you for the invitation to participate and think about the question, what is sustainability anyway? And to take us through what might be an introduction to the three pillars of sustainable healthcare. I'm not assuming that everybody is familiar with these prior to today. So for this particular session, I would hope you should be able to explain what's meant by terms sustainability and sustainable development, to discuss three pillars or sometimes referred to as dimensions of sustainability. You may have heard of them as environmental, social and economic or as biosphere, society and economy. And yes, to explore a little how you could align your practice with, for example, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and or with various initiatives being led by FIP and other relevant healthcare organisations. So what is sustainability? Could be considered a domain of quality, so fits very much in uh, our concept of professionalism and professional identity formation. Sustainability is a domain of competency framework. So when we think of education, is it a domain of our competency frameworks? Because that will help drive its introduction, both for developing healthcare professionals and addressing potential gaps in practicing professionals where it wouldn't have been uh, a core concept um, through four more decades of education. Sustainability depends on a systems approach so we've probably been used to thinking about a relatively local systems approach in the context of global issues and really thinking from a global point of view where if we use resources, um, is the replacement rate in equilibrium? And that, of course, leads very much to the future thinking in sustainable development as defined by the UN Brooklyn Commission that it being development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. One useful paper might be Moore and colleagues where looking at components of sustainability, they suggest a definition should have five constructs that it's after a defined period of time. So futures thinking in there again, the program and our strategies for implementation continue to be delivered and our individual behavior change, not just about the knowledge we put into people's heads, but how their behaviors um, might change and be maintained and might evolve and adapt over time and continue in those adaptations to produce benefits for individuals and systems. So perhaps a useful paper to look at. 
World Health Organization, very much relevant and aligned, of course, with FIP's aims and objectives. But sustainable development in WHO terms, they see it as a broad term to describe policies, projects, the hands-on, how are you going to action it, and investments that provide benefits today without sacrificing environmental, social and personal health in the future. So again, aligned with that Brundtland um, futures thinking, future generation thinking. And of course, the expectation from WHO's point of view that the benefits would be felt across a wide cross section and specifically mentioning, including reductions in pollution and environmental related disease and of course um, we're going to hear more on the pollution front from later speakers in today's webinar. So if we think about an introduction to these three pillars as they're referred to of sustainability we have um, environmental, social and economic and from an economic point of view we're used to asking is it portable now we must add the complexity of portable now and in the future. What are we stealing or taking from the future? Social, is it accessible for all? Is there sufficient engagement for whatever change is initiated to be kept going into the future? And environmental, does the action avoid damage to the natural environment? In fact, many would say we need to go a stage further and say, can we undo some of the damage that science obviously makes explicit has already been done? And typically that's presented as a Venn diagram, i.e. the interlocking circles. And we're always interested in the overlap areas. So livable, viable and equitable, of course, come to mind. But I've starred the centre point. Is it sustainable? What are we um, doing that might address this concept of sustainability? And what the UN did in 2015 was sought to give a more operative edge um, to the, this such a massive field by defining uh, the question of sustainability and sustainable development by reference to 17 separate policy actions. So again, we see the language from WHO replicated here. And they're, they're referred to as the 17 SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, and typically represented in a block format. The top line of the block, largely speaking, related to societal um, concepts. Economy was the middle block and largely speaking, environment was the lower block. In futuristically, thinking globally and cooperative at a much bigger scale than we'd previously done. The risk of course is that you can take an a la carte or smorgasbord approach um, to the block image and say, well, we'll do something about global health and perhaps we'll do something about reducing inequalities and something about life on land. And with recognising that simply isn't enough um, and that we need to get this global view into our mindset, um, the Stockholm Resilience Institute represented it and image each does matter. So as a wedding cake format. And of course, the, um, the idea was that this representation is a more useful visualization and um, making us conceptualize and accept that unless we have a functioning biosphere, well, really, we don't have a place for society to function. And if you don't have biosphere and society in place, well, then the question of a functioning economy becomes redundant. And what's particularly interesting, whether you think of it as a cake stand or a wedding cake, it tiered wedding cake, that they used um, SDG 17 partnerships for the goal of collaboration and cooperation as um, the co-joining piece um, for it all. And um, that illustration obviously is available on their website. I've included this one for information because it does strike me that the move from the block format to the cake stand format also represents some movement in society. So for example, back then in 2015, we were thinking of affordable and clean energy as being an economic factor. 
Whereas now we think of it more as a societal issue. And of course, clean energy and equity around access to energy for safe cooking in many parts of the world um, becomes an issue for consideration when we're thinking globally, rather than perhaps more nation states and communities thinking about carbon reductions by comparison with what we've been using in former years. So that slide is in the deck to help prompt that type of consideration. So because this is all derived from United Nations, it makes sense to also look at the UNESCO framework when we think about education for sustainable development. So I've just pulled out a few um, key concepts from their 2017 documentation. First of all, a bit about definition from, for ESD, Education for Sustainable Development. Their key pedagogical approaches, which shouldn't intimidate any of us. And the fact that there are eight key sustainability competencies. So when designing, designing professional development programs or undergraduate programs, we can think about how these competencies can be nurtured, supported and demonstrated in a way that we can assure that they are in place. So that notion from the definition that ESD empowers learners with knowledge, skills, values and attributes, which underpin behaviours, but to take informed decisions decisions and to act for environmental integrity, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So very much around how we will encourage people to engage, advocate and behave. Pedagogical approaches they promote support that thinking. The notion, as always, you begin with a learner centered approach. Where is the learner at? Where are our evolving healthcare professionals at when they're introduced to this concept? action-oriented learning, what will they be able to do? And therefore, how do we design that we motivate and nurture behaviours through the educational process that they'll be able to replicate out in practice? And of course, transformative learning. Well, I always say transformation is what happens to the learner. But um, helpfully, they specify constructivism and problem-based learning as key routes to the transformation of learning envisage. So whether it's individual constructivism, that reflective approach, or social constructivism, how we force discussion, debate and negotiation so that our biases are challenged, those will be familiar to us as educators of healthcare professionals. And the competencies begin with the systems thinking competency. This broad notion that if I nudge here, does it affect something elsewhere? And thinking beyond our national boundaries in the context of sustainable development to understand complex systems and be able to analyze them and how those systems are embedded differently in different cultures and jurisdictions. And of course, anticipatory competency, futures thinking, normative, strategic collaboration, critical thinking and self-awareness, that reflective piece will all be familiar to us. An integrated problem solving course sits right alongside interprofessional education and interprofessional learning. Just to give you one example that you might be prompted to explore more, I picked Sustainable Development Goal 4, which is education. We will, of course, revert then to um, the healthcare concept. But the notion that inclusive and equitable quality education and to promote lifelong learning. So within the targets for that, of course, equal access is in there. And very much by 2030, ensure that all learners acquire the knowledge and skills needed to promote sustainable development, not just saying to understand it, to advocate, to get involved, et cetera, as we expect healthcare professionals will do. And of course, all the issues, gender, um, equity, promotion of uh, culture, peace and non-violence, global citizenship are all there. But I've given you the links, so do explore. There's lots of resources in there for whatever initiative you might be thinking of in the with. So back to health and the focus of social and environmental determinants of health. And I'm just suggesting Barton and Grant, Grant as one place because this image sort of very much links the language of the global ecosystem with how we probably all think of teaching social determinants of health or engaging our practitioners in thinking around public health and um, moving away from just the one patient in front of me at the counter in the pharmacy on a Saturday 
who this big picture turned. And the central circle, of course, is bits of me as an individual. I can't change my age. I can't change certain hereditary factories. And of course, the outer circle being the global and the natural environment that we are now all collaboratively seeking um, to consider as a human species. But the inner blue circles, of course, are there, that notion of lifestyle, community and, and local issues um, that we turn to when we talk about some of the examples later in the webinar. But of course, this also makes us stand back and think, oh, priority actions probably also include um, moving away somewhat from narrow reductionist perspectives, thinking about our programs for new healthcare practitioners, and not forgetting that when existing healthcare practitioners came through their original education programs, the question of sustainability and sustainable development wasn't as core. And these types of um, frameworks from UNESCO certainly weren't part of the curriculum design at that stage. So we don't want to uh, forget either side of that. It's been really interesting over the last few weeks exploring the FIP website, and it has been particularly active, as, as you could only expect. Um, the Green Pharmacy Practice Initiative in 2015, for example, talked about um, taking responsibility for the impact of medicine. And by 2023, the FIP statement of policy course has expanded and talking about within pharmacy um, in, in its broadest sense. Um, the 2016 um, statement of policy shows that this was a trajectory. The advocacy piece that we want in our practitioners, FIP are living that and being the advocates, for example, I've pulled one there from COP26. And of course, one of the specific examples of call to action um, it really focuses on mitigating the impact of air pollution on health. And again, that's going to be expanded on later in the webinar. Another initiative, Transforming Global Pharmacy by FIP Development Goals, 21 of them. Let's not forget that they're there and the resources that sit behind that. I pulled out Sustainability in Pharmacy, which is the FIP Development Goal, 21. And to remind us that the way FIP policy tends to work is to think in three elements, workforce and education, practice and science. And behind each of those tabs are supports, ideas, um, initiatives, collaborations, etc. how we might move forward more um, quickly. It does appear from the science that the next decade is particularly important. And um, so we really need to find ways of ramping things up. And again, of course, anything FIP does starts from a global perspective, which is very helpful. I can't leave you without mentioning the Centre for Sustainable Healthcare and Principles of Sustainable Clinical Practice and the organize, charitable organisation in the UK, because I want to say it reinforces for me the collegiality amongst pharmacists. And I want to acknowledge pharmacist Nuala Hansen, who never heard of me and I never heard of her before I joined this project and over the last few months has really helped me upscale very quickly. And this centre has since 2008 really sought to understand connections between health and environment and how to reduce healthcare's resource footprint. And they've come up with principles of sustainable clinical practice that, of course, begin with preventatives. So health promotion, health prevention, um, and all of those issues are the starting point. And after that, patient empowerment and self-care to manage their own um, healthcare. Then they move to um, level three or principle three, that notion of when care is required, think always, how can we minimize wasteful activity in a holistic sense, in a systems thinking um, approach? And finally, where there are systems in place, how can we begin to adjust to the thinking that if there's a low carbon alternative, even in, if individually we're talking about tiny fractions, if we've millions of instances, that can make a big difference. And of course, inhaler use um, is one that's going to come to all of our minds. And again, the practical application that we saw with WHO, that we see with the SDGs, that we see with FIP's approaches. They have um, suggestions and systems and programs where you can 
uh, get support in how to generate practical applications from their frameworks. And in their case, um, the CSH, the Centre for Sustainable Healthcare, uses driver diagrams. And I've just taken one from their publicly available website there. And I can't leave you without a couple of thoughts on healthcare ethics. And, you know, I, I do feel um, empowered in that we can build on what we already do have and teach. And my label in Trinity in the School of Pharmacy is professionalism and ethics, whatever that means. And largely use um, principles, uh, Beecham and Children's Four Principles of Respect for Autonomy, Beneficence, Non-Maleficence and Distributive Justice. And I'm sure that's familiar to a lot of people on the call. And then in fifth year level, I also lead on public health um, uh, module. And I do draw on Klugman. And Klugman also has four principles, but presented in a hierarchy in public health. And the primary principle is solidarity. And the types of questions that came to my mind as I finished preparing this presentation is the notion that most of our codes of conduct prioritise duty of care to that patient, a very individualistic approach, which many times causes a discombobulation and unease with solidarity. A little bit of rebalancing might need to be done there. Beneficence and non-maleficence, i.e. do good and do no harm. And I always say, I know of no medicine that doesn't have the potential to do harm. So we are risk managers. We're constantly doing that balance. Now we've to add the future thinking. We're doing good for current generations might equate to doing harm for future generations, or perhaps withholding the gold star from current patients in order to take account of not doing harm for future generations. And that's before we even begin to think about the issues if global needs exceed available resources. I hope you found that useful and I'm very pleased um, to take questions later on or answer questions on the chat box. And I'm going to hand back to Betty and Cara. Thank you, Cicely, for such an insightful presentation. You've made me think twice about principles um, of ethics in pharmacy. Thank you. Um, I'd like to introduce you now to Professor Sharon Pledger. And um, I will have to take a little bit of time to explain where she is at and where she has been recently, which is very exciting. So Sharon currently works in NHS Highland as a consultant in, in pharmaceutical pub and public health, using her dual registration as a pharmacist and as a public health specialist focusing on the use of medicines at a population level, developing policy and practice covering anything that involves the use of medicines. Throughout the pandemic, she was program lead for vaccines, helping to plan the COVID vaccination program in the Highlands. But some years ago, she became acutely aware that healthcare, especially the use of medicines, is impacting on the environment and contributing to climate change, which is dam damaging not only to the planet's health, but that of our public too. This led her to become a founding member of and NHS Highland slash Scotland lead of the One Health Breakthrough Partnership, which is currently focused on the impact of pharmaceuticals on the water environment. I'm sure she will explain some of this to you in her presentation. Sharon has um, a lot of accolades and positions, visiting professor at the School of Pharmacy and Life Sciences in the Robert Gordon University in Aberdeen and other, and other um, positions. But I'd like to um, highlight some of her um, achievements um, recently. Recently, she was lucky she says but i'm sure she has earned it very very um adequately um she was selected from amongst 400 women for the international leadership program for women in stem homeward bound and is the first ever nhs employee pharmacist or public health scientist to gain a place on the program i think she just came back from antarctica 
to bring uh, together all the aspects of the program and finally meet participants face to face and see the effects of climate change up close so that she can continue to inspire people to action over the climate crisis. I now invite Sharon to share her screen and start her presentation entitled Thinking Beyond the Patient. What is the pharmacy profession's duty of care to the wider population and the planet? Thank you, Sharon. Thank you so much, Betty, for that lovely introduction and also for the invitation. And also thanks to Cicely for really setting up um, my presentation as well. So as um, Betty said, I'm a public health specialist, so I think in population terms rather than an individual patients in front of me. And many of you will probably be practicing healthcare clinicians, treating patients. But today, I'd like to introduce you to the concept of our duty of care, not only to the patient in front of us, but also to that wider population across the world and ultimately the health of our planet. And um, some of my slides do have QR codes on. And of course, this is being recorded so you can go back and access the, the papers and websites that I'm about to uh, use as references. So our learning objectives today, um, I'm going to tell you about the impact of health on climate change and the impact of climate change on health. And then we're going to consider a little bit about the ethics. And finally, I'm going to leave you with some top tips about how you can practice with a climate lens. Now, everybody, I'm sure, is aware of climate change, the net zero agenda. But again, I'd like to remind you that we're actually in the midst of a triple planetary crisis. And that's made up of climate change, the net zero agenda with carbon emissions, um, the nature or biodiversity crisis, and also a pollution crisis. And I think it's quite helpful to consider this One Health triad where we know that the health of people, animals and the environment are all intrinsically linked. So if one of those sections is unhealthy, there are ramifications for other parts of the triad. And if I use COVID as an example, we had infected bats that transmitted a zoonotic disease to humans, and that then saw us as human beings use lots more stuff in our healthcare systems and pollute our environment with more medicines, discarded face masks, a huge quantity of plastic waste from hospital stays and vaccination programs across the world. So it is vital that we have a healthy environment because of all those things that you can see outside the, the outside of the triad in this diagram, these are all really essential for human health and they are provided to us by our environment. So if the Earth's ecosystem is to continue to support our human health, we need to maintain population health and we need to provide our health care in ways that actually sustains our planet. Now, the bottom line is that this planetary crisis has been caused by us, by human activity. And it's a combination of population growth consumption, our consumerist practices, and our choices around innovation and technology. And certainly in higher income countries, we live in a must have, want more society, and we have corresponding high energy intensive lifestyles. So let's now look at some of the evidence about our overuse of resources. Um, this is a particularly interesting website. It's called Earth Overshoot Day. And the, the thinking behind it is that Earth Overshoot Day actually marks the day when humanity's demand for ecological resources for nature actually exceeds what the Earth can possibly regenerate in the rest of that year. And if you put it really simply, it's about when we bust Earth's budget and we're living in an overshoot. And you can see the dates at the bottom there. Over the past four years, Earth overshoot is becoming earlier and earlier every year because we are using more and more of the Earth's resources. Another way to look at the issue is to consider how many planets, how many Earths each country would need every year to cope with the living habits in that country. And we can see that there that the USA tops the list. So the USA is currently using 5.1 planets worth of resource in nature every year. 
The average for the world is 1.75. So effectively, all around the world, we are using more ecosystem resources than the world is able to provide and to regenerate for us. And this donut is another way of looking at social and planetary boundaries across the world. The donut has two concentric rings, the green rings, the darker green rings, the outer one and the inside one. And on the inside one, it's the social foundation. These are the things that we need to survive and thrive as human beings. They're life's essentials. The outer ring is an ecological ceiling. And that ensures that humanity does not collectively overshoot those planetary boundaries that I mentioned a minute ago, and that we work to protect Earth's life supporting systems. All those things that you saw around the triad diagram that actually keep us alive. The light green circle in the middle is the space where our needs are actually met adequately and we are able to live a healthy, safe and in a just space as well. And the minute we start to overshoot either of these ceilings, then we start to see an erosion of what is safe and just for us. So let's have a think about where pharmacy, where prescribing medicines, where healthcare provision might come into this ecological ceiling. If we think about the CFC inhalers that we used in the past, they depleted our ozone layer. Climate change, carbon emissions, that comes directly from our inhalers that we're still using, our metered dose inhalers and our anaesthetic gases. Ocean acidification comes from pharmaceutical pollution, chemical pollution from all our other healthcare procedures. Air pollution, of course, is coming from our patient travel and the supplies, bringing supplies across the world to our health systems. Freshwater withdrawals happen when we manufacture and provide healthcare. We pump nitrogen and phosphorus into our environment from our wastewater, from soap and disinfectant use. Biodiversity loss and land conversion comes from our supply chains, all those things that we need to be manufactured to provide our health care. So all that health care that we all use ourselves and that we provide as professionals is actually contributing to that overshoot of ecological boundaries. And ultimately, it will erode the safe space that we as human beings have to live within. So let's look a little bit more closely at healthcare's impact itself. Across the world, um, global healthcare contributes to 4.4% of the total net carbon emissions. It's the same as burning 514 coal powered stations 24 hours a day, every single day of the year. And about 25% of the NHS of, of the National Health Service greenhouse gas emissions in the UK come from medicines alone. Um, this pie chart shows the breakdown of the emissions that we have in Scotland from our health service. And you can see on the green on the left hand side, um, the anaesthetic gases and inhalers are about 5%. And then on the blue at the top right hand side, the rest, the 20% that comes from medicals, medicines and the chemicals that we use. And this um, chart is actually showing us the whole healthcare sector, so primary care, acute care, hospital care. And we can see that large, that tall orange bar is the medicines that we use in primary care. They make up about 90% of its carbon footprint. So it's a sizable proportion. Now, everyone's thinking about the net zero agenda, but as I said, um, we also need to think about um, medicines pollution of our environment. And this diagram from the OECD report um, shows the roots into water and soil. And if you look at the right hand side, um, you will see that's for human pharmaceuticals and the left is for animal pharmaceuticals. So we have to consider the polluting effect of medicines because the medicines are made to actually have a biological effect. So when they're excreted, either as the parent drug or as metabolites, they continue to have that same biological effect on the key receptors that we find in the ecosystem, whether that's in our fish, our crustaceans or our plant life, frogs, etc. Now, as clinicians, most of us probably don't think about what happens when the medicine leaves the patient's body. We're more concerned with what it does in the patient's body. How effective is it? How safe is it? What interactions, what side effects, etc. 
But it's interesting that actually about 30 to 100% of an oral dose of a medicine gets excreted. It goes out via our wastewater treatment plants that you can see in the diagram. These don't remove all pharmaceuticals. So ultimately, it ends up in water courses. And we should also remember that about 80% of the waste in the world doesn't go through treatment plants. It goes straight into the environment. And this tongue-in-cheek cartoon is, is showing us that about 90% of what we find in the environment relates, you know, the medicines, comes from patient use. And that can be by patients taking the medicine or patients just flushing it down their toilet or their sink because they think it's the safest thing to do. Um, about 90% comes from patient taking it, 5% comes from going down the toilet, and about 5% comes from manufacturing. Now, there have been studies to look at um, pollution across the world from medicines. And this is the biggest ever um, study. It was published last year um, in York University in the UK. It looked at every continent of the world. Um, it tested 258 rivers and tested for 61 pharmaceuticals. And in a quarter of all the results, all the rivers, they found that the levels of pharmaceuticals found were a threat to environmental and or human health. It wasn't surprising that the highest concentrations they were finding were our painkillers, our antibiotics and anticonvulsants. But what they did find was that the highest concentrations were actually found in our lower to middle income countries. So the authors have put a hypothesis forward that socioeconomics is actually involved in pollution. And I'll touch again on that later. So now I want to talk about um, the cli what climate change does to human health. We've talked about what we as humans do to climate change. So um, climate change has been described as the biggest single threat to our public health. And already there on the slide, you can see that 25%, a quarter of all our global deaths from heart attacks, strokes, lung cancer and respiratory disease are being caused by climate change. And that's already. It impacts on so many facets that provide good health for us, including clean air, allergies, food, conflict, waterborne and vector-borne diseases, and of course, mental health as well. So the worse that climate change is, the worse our human health becomes, and the more healthcare we use, and the more medicines we give out. So that adds to the planetary crisis, and round and round we go in that circle. So what we need to do is break the cycle of emissions and pollution so that we can actually preserve our ecosystem that we maintain good health and that ultimately we reduce demand for health services as well. But yeah, as Cicely so nicely um, told us, there, there are key ethical tensions. I've just pulled out three of those. Um, it's the individual patient versus the whole population and indeed the world population. It's being sustainable versus that equal access that Betty talked about, that social justice at the beginning. And it's about sustainability versus the health of the population too. So let's first look at the individual versus the whole. The Hippocratic Oath in Medicine tells us that first we must do no harm. And I think that this was initially referring to that patient in front of us. But as a modern society and the state that we're in with the planet, I think we now surely need to include the do no harm to our whole ecosystem. Because without that healthy planet, we won't have a healthy population. And I know that our professional training mainly focuses on getting the right medicine to the right patient in the right dose, the right time, the right place, etc. But we can liken everything about pl climate change to the pandemic. So, yes, it affects individuals. It makes us sicker. But we have to consider climate change and population health on that global scale. Just like in the pandemic, when we shut the borders between our countries, we locked down our communities, we ran vaccination programmes at population level so that we could get individual good health. So that individual health versus the whole population health, it's a definite tension and it's something that many of us are not trained in. So now thinking about that sustainability versus the social justice bit, both of these elements are vital to being healthy. They are mutually reinforcing goals. And let's not forget that 80% of the world's wealth 
benefits only 20% of the world's population. The vast majority of people have very little. And poverty in its, in its own right is one of the major factors that contributes to poor health. But it absolutely reduces the ability of our more vulnerable populations across the world to cope with the environmental decline. So climate change affects our lower to middle income countries more than it affects the higher income countries. So we need to think, how can the higher income countries actually support levels of healthcare consumption without exploiting the vulnerable populations in other parts of the world? And bringing in um, that study again that talked about socioeconomic pollution, we've got to remember that countries like India are the biggest suppliers of our medicines across the world and also 60% of the world's vaccinations. So we are doing good from getting those medicines, but we are doing harm from those medicines actually being made in those countries and not having um, the wastewater treatment that we do have in other parts of the world. And lastly, sustainability versus health. So we've seen across the 20th century that improvements in health are linked really closely to economic development. But increasingly, we are seeing that public health is decreasing, we have more problems, and that's because of the intensity of the agriculture, the industry and the energy that we are using. And again, that applies to healthcare. So how can we treat patients effectively using fewer resources, using fewer medicines? And how do we start to think about health promotion and keeping people healthy rather than working not in health systems, but working in sickness systems? So we've, we've talked about climate change, we've talked about the, the ethical tensions. So I want to move on now to how you can practice more sustainable health care. And a definition that we use in Scotland is that sustainable health care is high quality, it's evidence based, it must deliver value. We must have those clinical outcomes that really matter to people. And we have to have positive social impact and we have to do as little harm as possible to our environment. And we protect not only our generations now, but also our future generations. So I've been involved in helping the Royal Pharmaceutical Society in Great Britain actually develop sustainability policies across these four domains. So I'm going to talk a little bit about all of those now. First of all, I want to turn to waste. And this OECD report tells us that 20% of the care that we offer offers no value at all to our patients. So why are we doing it? Are we practicing evidence-based medicine? And that one in 10 patients that comes into our care, we actually harm them. And then we use 10% of the money that we should be using to provide services on trying to fix those mistakes and treat the infections that they get whilst in hospital. So again, we're causing harm, not only to our patients, but to the environment, because we're using more stuff in healthcare. And of course, we know that there's loads of overdiagnosis, overtesting and overtreatment. Something that you might find useful in your practice is this acronym, um, BRAN. So what are the benefits? What are the risks of any intervention? And that could be a clinical intervention or it could be prescribing a medicine. Can we give the patient try anything else like social prescribing? And actually, do they need an intervention right now? What if we actually do, do nothing, just wait and see? So I'd like you to try and think about this in your practice, and that will automatically lead you to be providing more sustainable health care because you won't be wasting medicines that aren't going to provide value to the patient. Adherence. This is a huge issue. We know that 50, 60 percent of patients do not take their medicines as they're intended on the prescription, and some don't take them at all. And if they don't take them, excuse me, they don't get clinical outcomes. And they may keep coming back into the health system because they still feel sick. So they come back to their pharmacist, their nurse, their GP. We do more things to them, more interventions. We have more waste. We have more carbon footprint, more pollution. And ultimately, we have more morbidity and even patient mortality if they're not taking their medicines. This slide will be um, probably familiar to many people. This table shows the medicines from one deceased person. So how, as pharmacists, can we let a patient get to this level of stockpiling and not taking medicines? Are we checking up that they are taking the medicines? Are we advising them how to get the best out of it? 
There are many factors involved, but pharmacists have a key role here in ensuring um, patients adhere to their medicine and that they reduce waste. And another key area for us is adverse drug, drug events. 15% of older people that come into hospital are there because of an ADE. 20% that get admitted in our acute medical units are as well. More harm, more hospital admissions, more stuff being done to patients, more stuff being used. But yet it's a key part of our professional role is always to think about adverse drug events. So we can and we should do better here. I love this quote from um, a doctor over in America. If a bad thing's happening to a patient, a drug did it until proven otherwise. And we should always have that at the back of our mind. There are a huge amount of resources available across the world to help us with appropriate polypharmacy. Um, so I hope that you will look up some of those after the, uh, the webinar today. I wanted to show you this vision of my merry-go-round, and this is what I think patients are on. They're jumping on and off this merry-go-round with their repeat visits, their ambulance transport, their A&E attendance, getting admitted to hospital. And every time they do that, we're increasing carbon emissions, we're increasing pollution. So let's get them off that merry-go-round and let's make their treatment work first time for them. And as pharmacists, another one of our key roles. So I'd like to finish just with some take home messages for you. I know the patient in front of you matters, but so does our planet and so does the health system that you work in. And we can't have healthy patients along with an unhealthy planet. Yeah, we do have ethical tensions, but I hope that I've showed you that just working at the top of your profession, at the top of your license, you can actually help your patient, help your population and help the planet as well. Now, I know that climate change is a health crisis, but I also know and I'm confident that you as a healthcare professional can actually change that climate crisis and we can turn it around. We can have a healthy planet and we can have a healthy population. So I hope I've inspired you to go out and look through a climate lens in your professional practice every day. So thank you very much for listening and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Sharon, for a beautiful presentation. Your first question is from me. I'd love to know how your trip to Antarctica went. So please share when you, when you get to it. Oh, now, I'd, Thank you. <laughs> it I was thank my you. great pleasure to uh, welcome uh, our last and, and dear guest, in Auckland, where it is approaching 2 a.m. in the morning, we thank you, Dr. Sanya Ram, for being there and being with us tonight or today. Uh, Dr. Sanya Ram is a pharmacist and a lawyer and a senior lecturer at the School of Pharmacy at the University of Auckland. She is an emerging researcher at the intersection of pharmacy practice and law, exploring the legal determinants of health and the impact of regulations on practice. So I hope you can start, share your screen, Sanya. Thank you so much, Betty. Um, Kira Koto Kato, uh, very well and welcome everyone. Um, it's such a pleasure to have the opportunity to share our insights from a bibliometric review exploring the um, research around green pharmacy and progressing that agenda. I think um, when we think about environmental sustainability and pharmacy, most of us would be motivated to do what we consider would be the right thing to do um, and collaborate and uh, have collective uh, decision-making to try and achieve those better outcomes. And it's clear from the discussions and that Sharon and Cecily has, have shared is that um, there's certainly a duty to de deliver sustainable health care. 
And the notion of green pharmacy goes well beyond um, just addressing the pharmaceuticals in the environment is looking at it as broader and the implications and impact on the broader healthcare and population health. So what we wanted to do was to try and explore where the research is at in terms of green pharmacy and its contribution to practice. And that's what I'll share with you today in terms of looking at um, Um, looking at where the research has been in green pharmacy and try and look at who is publishing uh, in the field of environmentally sustainable pharmacy over time, to what extent to look at where these the geographical differences are. And in particular, um, in terms of the law and the code of conduct, um, and ethics that um, the practical ethics that have been applied, um, and to look at the themes that the research is currently exploring um, around the topic of green pharmacy. So, in terms of our methods, it was a scoping study of green pharmacy space using bibliometric uh, methodology uh, and specific uh, publications regarding environmental sustainability in pharmacy was explored through five databases, um, Medline, Embase, Scopus, ScienceDirect and IPA. Um, and the articles were analysed to determine publication types, author affiliations and looking at uh, networks between authors um, and thematic analysis of the um, full text was conducted. The bibliometric parameters were analysed through Excel, but we also tried to look at the co-authorship network and how broadly those authors were collaborating across the globe. Um, and that was done using Giphy and the geographical sources of publication was um, visualised using Tableau. There were 3,000 articles that were retrieved through the searches and um, 155 of those publications were uh, met the inclusion criteria and were included in the analysis. Um, largely, the studies that were included were empirical research um, with narrative reviews presenting um, at similar rates to cross-sectional surveys. Um, there's also um, interviews that were included and some cohort studies. Now, looking at the results, um, clearly there's uh, an increase in the number of publications over time and looking at 2019 um, onwards, there's certainly been more research in the green pharmacy area being published. But in terms of the um, geographical spread and where these publications are coming out, largely from the US uh, and the in the UK. Um, there's a couple of uh, publications out of China, so there are 10 publications included. Um, and with Canada, India, um, Australia, Romania and Germany having six to seven publications coming out through, through the analysis we did. So although um, there's certainly been an increase in the geographical spread of these articles and where they're coming from, they're still predominantly from your larger countries. Um, in terms of the co-authorship network, there's certainly connections between the publications globally. So 23 of the uh, 42 identifying countries were collaborating through looking at all the authors in each of those um, papers that were published. Over time, um, you've seen more of a interest uh, across the globe in terms of where the research is at, but you still have, um, have um, some pockets of um, more pro prolific um, publishers in this area. Um, you, you've got 30% uh, of the total um, coming out through the US even uh, up until um, 2022. But certainly from 20, 
2006 to 2002, there's been certainly a shift in the publications and where they are based. Looking at the themes that the 155 articles presented, as the previous speakers have spoken about, they certainly um, research in terms of impact on environment, um, looking at the active ingredients. So um, 35 publications talked about water and soil uh, contamination, certainly in terms of competencies, um, attitudes and knowledge, there's certainly articles in that. What we wanted, I wanted to focus on was looking at the law and ethics and where the publications and information on law and ethics was centred on. There were 30 um, articles that touched on legal and ethical frameworks and a further 15 looking at adherence to guidelines. In terms of um, the 30 articles on legal and ethical frameworks, um, certainly an increase in uh, publications of recent times. There's certainly a broad look at um, the countries that these um, articles were coming out of. And there's quite a bit of comparative analysis done and particularly in terms of waste disposal um, and looking at um, Finland, France, Spain, Hungary and Romania in terms of a comparative analysis on the regulation uh, relating to green pharmacy compared to um, other articles looking at Canada, the US and um, the EU in terms of um, the progress, the differences and the similarities between that. In terms of uh, lead authors or uh, authors pr uh, um, that came up the most, it would be Toma Alexandra and um, Chris Anaphilia from Romania, but there's also authors from the US um, and the UK that come through strongly in these areas as well. Looking at the elements of the law and ethics themes throughout these articles, um, you've got uh, look, um, you know, regulation of green pharmacy, more more looking at the waste disposal and the guidelines and the frameworks centre around waste disposal. But um, a couple of articles looked at key competencies that would be required. Um, also, responsibility. Who, where does the responsibility lie? And only one of those articles seemed to suggest. Um, where participants suggested that perhaps it might not be um, all fully focused on, on, you know, pharmacy or the manufacturers. There's still quite a lot of discussion on regulations around the active ingredients. And, and I'll just go through that in a minute in terms of looking at um, regulation of active ingredients before they become medicines and at the registration phase of, of um medicines in the, in the respective countries. Um, both Cecile and, um, Cecily and Sharon spoke about, um, you know, at first do no harm, but in terms of, um, you know, looking at it from a population health, as Sharon mentioned, there's a, certainly a common theme that including and establishing um, improved legal and ethical frameworks that regulate pharmaceuticals in particular would be quite important in discussion on extending the scope of GMPs to cover environmental protect, protection and production outside of Europe for both finished medicines and APIs. And I know that countries are at different levels in terms of uh, implementing these um, environmental uh, risk assessment and impact statements at when these products are registered so that there's greater awareness of it. Um, and in terms of sharing that knowledge across to pharmacists in terms of how these products could be um, disposed of safely and the risk associated with each of them won't necessarily be the same. There's variations between countries in terms of how pharmaceuticals are disposed of and the laws required in terms of compliance. And interestingly, quite a number of those 15 articles talked about how even despite having disposal practices, some of them 
um, a lot of them were not complied with. So the discussion around whether they should be compliance checks and sanctions in relation to um, waste disposal. Yeah, this was a theme that went throughout many of those articles in terms of what, um, as Prof Roche discussed, the social and environmental determinants of health. And as um, Sharon referred to in terms of the One Health Triad and the role of socioeconomics in pollution and environmental um, care as well as health. And so the environmental conditions and the reflection around the interconnectedness between environment, health and social justice certainly came through in those 30 articles. Um, quite a few of the articles talked about the call for stronger policies and measures, uh, especially in terms of looking at vulnerable populations and ensuring that the burden of uh, environmental pollution uh, doesn't lie with the most vulnerable and the lower socioeconomic background. So the intersectionality and interconnectedness was a theme that came throughout the research that we reviewed. The other element that came through quite strongly and certainly in the more recent papers was around eco-pharmacovigilance and the concept that the detection, evaluation and prevention of the environmental adverse effects um, for certain products is quite uh, acutely um, available, but in terms of the chronic impacts and um, the, the, the long-term data in terms of the impact of it through the uh, impact on both the environment and people, and to look at um, how these can be shared. Whilst we know products are in the water systems and have affected um, the climate and the environment quite severely in terms of having network infrastructures, as we do with pharmacovigilance activities and um, reports of them, to have a similar system for eco but also sharing that. And I know that there's quite a bit of work that um, different countries and different organisations have looked at in terms of classifying pharmaceuticals into risk categories based on aspects of environmental um, persistence and bioaccumulation and toxicity. And so having that global environmental monitoring and sharing of data as we do with the pharmacovigilance structures that exist globally and whether that could be a applied to, um, to the environmental impact of pharmaceutical contamination. And that's something that a couple of, quite a few of the articles alluded to um, and discussed. So in conclusion, I mean, clearly, and looking at the articles, there's Certainly a gap in the literature when you look at specifically looking at ethical considerations in um, progressing the green agenda in pharmacy. Only two of the articles specifically looked at, um, you know, ethical considerations throughout it, but certainly threads throughout all the legal analysis and comparative analysis um, gives a very clear picture in, in how these are consi um, considered. And there's certainly discussion on universal guidelines in legislation and looking at the FIP documents that came out um, in 2023, it does go to quite a length in terms of sharing that information and looking at the impacts and the insights and guidance directly related to green pharmacy and helping um, move that discussion and um, forward. Um, most of the literature suggests a lack of guidelines and consistent guidelines globally and, and you know, discusses um, that more needs to be implemented. And certainly there's um, more of a call for collaborations. And the image on the left is the um, author network analysis. And clearly there's groups that work together across the globes. But in terms of um, the interconnectedness between the groups, um, there isn't as much 
collaboration is perhaps it could be in terms of the global reach uh, and getting the the information and sharing of that through um, the network analysis we did with in terms of where the authors are based. And so there's clearly a call for more collaboration between countries and um, sharing of that information in terms of looking at it through um, the eco pharmacovigilance networks um, that I talked about there's certainly guidelines and legislation regarding medication disposal in certain countries and quite a number of countries have these. But um, a lot of the surveys and the studies suggested that perhaps they're not being followed as rigorously as they could be. And so having um, standards and policies that actually are implemented effectively becomes quite important and having uh, universally governing legislation certainly does have an impact, but so do having ethical considerations throughout each of the decision points um, throughout um, progressing that green agenda. I just want to thank the students that um, collated the data and put this um, project together and the co-supervisors being um, Ms. Lynn Bai and Associate Professor Shane Skyhill. There are a number of references, so there's 45 in terms of, and I'm happy to share them if, they, if um, anyone would like them, but there's a collection of these in here. Thank you so much. And thank you, Sanya, for staying up to 2 a.m. and past and staying with us for the Q&A. So I'll hand over to Carl to please facilitate the Q&A for this session. Good evening, everybody. Um, and I see that there are quite a few questions already that have been posted in the Q&A section. There's also a couple of questions in the chat. If you could put them into the question and answer section, and if there's any further that you would like to be asked, uh, please uh, add them. And what we'll do is we'll start going through the questions. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to open up the panel to all of us so that we can uh, speak to the um, through the questions and I would like to ask the first question to Cicely which uh, was asked earlier on uh, to transform pharmacy profession education is vital so what is the effort of FIP to maintain quality of the profession as well as to harmonize it and that's from uh, Asma Moore Yenesu Okay, well, I, I certainly am not qualified to answer on behalf of FIP in its totality. Um, but to transform the pharmacy profession, I actually think FIP are active in this area. Um, so transforming in the context of uh, education for sustainable development would take a, a bit of a reimagining of how we design the programs that we use to train pharmacists. And what UNESCO are guiding us is saying that even before we get into the profession specific, um, the profession specific concepts that Sharon and Sanya were talking about, there are fundamentals to be understood and they are encompassed in those eight competencies that at a generic level, we think of systems and we understand that systems in the context of sustainability are global. So we're doing our little piece and we move out from there. I think perhaps the question also has a broader um, uh, question that all three of us touched on, whether the policy, the professional guidelines, the competency frameworks on which or by which regulators drive us in one direction or the other need to universally refer to sustainability or sustainable development as a domain. 
And if that were in there, in whatever your country's regulator or government or governance of higher education uh, structure is, if it were in there specified, so whether it's the seven star pharmacist, that should include a star. It, it, it doesn't matter which jurisdiction you come from. Um, so I think it's around us as educators thinking about what we prioritise for CPD and undergrad education. And it's about regulators collaborating to make sure the drivers towards excellence in sustainability um, is up there with a shining light on it. Thank you so much, Cicely. And may I add, uh, put in a plug for the academic pharmacy section. Um, if you're interested, please become a member if you aren't already of the section. Uh, they're doing some fantastic work around alignment of the uh, a comp competency framework for pharmacy education, uh, as well as for pharmacy educators. The next question is by Liz Breen, and I would like to direct that to Sharon. What can we do to promote greater adoption of circular economy principles in our production and consumption of medicines? Oh, that's a good question. Um, nice to see you on here, Liz, and connecting with that question. Circular economy. I think in the first instance, I don't think that people understand, many people across the world understand what circular economy actually means. So I think one of the initial things we need to do is increase knowledge, educate people, um, educate people about the production and consumption of medicines and what it's doing um, with regard to climate change. Um, I've just finished a Medical Research Council um, bid that was looking at developing eco-directed frameworks for prescribing decisions. And part of that was talking to um, prescribers of all sorts, um, doctors, dentists, radiotherapists, pharmacists across Scotland, and also talking to our patients and our public. And the big thing that came through from all of them um, was education, that we need to start it early. We need to start it in junior school to help people think about health promotion, um, self-responsibility, taking care of their own health so that they don't actually need medicines. And then if they do, helping them to make the best choices um, from the information that we have. So I know in some countries, in Scandinavia, for instance, there's labelling on medicine packets. And of course, there's an ethical tension there as well. And, and that came out in my research that people think, well, if you put that information on the packet, it might stop people from actually taking a medicine that they need. And I think, again, that comes down to us as pharmacists, as a pharmacy profession, actually explaining that risks and benefits so that people don't then have to, to look at that packet and make the decision themselves not to take it. So that was, um, yeah, knowledge and attitudes of people, education, um, labelling. With regards to the production, um, I think that pharmaceutical industry is, is really getting into um, circular economy. Um, it hits their bottom line, so, so they're going to want to, to make money at the end of the day out of the drugs they produce. Um, something that Sanya mentioned was the environmental risk assessments. Um, so I think what we could do in that at the minute, um, it's only medicines after 2006 that do undertake um, an environmental risk assessment across Europe to get their license, to get their marketing authorization. But even though they conduct that ERA, it's not taken into consideration in the licensing process for human medicines, but yet it is for veterinary medicines, for animal medicines. So I think we need to think about whether we need to level that playing field, um, because about 20% of the medicines that are licensed do have a significant um, damaging effect on, on our environment. And there is work going on in the pharmaceutical industry, because obviously most of the medicines we use are generics, and they came out well before 2006. So they're doing a look back exercise to try and do environmental risk assessments on those pre-2006 medicines. And that's being undertaken in the Premier project. And I've put both the MRC project and the Premier project um, links into the chat for people so that you can find out more. So in a nutshell, yeah, knowledge, education, um, and helping people to understand what circular economy is and what their role is in medicines. Thank you, Carl. Um, thank you, Sharon. And I would like to, first of all, thank Sanya for uh, presenting at 2 a.m. in the morning. I'm sure everybody is very thankful that you are here presenting for us from New Zealand. Um, but I'll want to skip ahead to a question 
from you uh, uh, for you, and that is, I thought it was quite an interesting question in the chat. We people from developing countries, there's many participants in from low income countries uh, participating today, uh, are facing lack of access from pharmaceutical waste disposal. So, what can you say about reverse logistics for those importers from developed countries? Gosh, that's a real issue, and it's not just developing countries that, um, you know, have difficulty in terms of um, getting rid of you, uh, the waste. And certainly in um, looking at options and looking at how some of these products can be broken down, there will be differences between um, depending on which product it is. And so if there is opportunities to actually safely dispose of it, and certainly there's other countries that have explored, um, you know, sending products to other countries to dispose of them. And if that was the only way you could um, dispose of them, I suppose it's something to consider. Um, but, yeah, there's certainly no answer that... Um, would apply to every situation and apply to every uh, product either. So it would be looking at the products in terms of whether how you deal with cytotoxics as opposed to your antibiotics or your uh, perhaps products that don't have as huge an uh, environmental impact. Thank you so much, Sanya. And I also should mention that Liz Breen has just put into the chat um, please get in touch uh, because they have, happen to have some research regarding reverse logistics. So I'm just going to open up to uh, all three panelists uh, a question um, if you, and it's a very sort of slightly different to what uh, Trisha Deep Sen has asked. Uh, so all three panelists, if you could ask what one factor uh, for us, pharmacists and pharmacy educators that are here on the call here today at our webinar, what one uh, action should they, in your opinion, uh, go away and commit to? Maybe we'll start with Cicely. With my educator hat on, I would say whoever or whatever organization is involved in continuing professional development for pharmacists, get in there, get some movement going. We've had a lot of suggestions today where resources are available. Get the discussion going amongst practicing pharmacists. They are the mentors of those coming out from the colleges, the hidden curriculum. Um, and to me, I, I, I have met both sides of the Atlantic, so many pharmacists. I still have to meet someone that I could suggest is going to their practice as a pharmacist with any other intention than doing good. And in this area of sustainable development, it's an unconscious incompetency for many. I go back six to 12 months for myself, how much was going on, I had no idea. And I'm still only beginning to understand how many resources are out there, how many movements are there, how we can contribute from where we are right now. So if I only get one pick, professional development of the existing workforce. Thank you so much for that call to action, Cicely. Over to you, Sharon. Yeah, so just add on to Cicely's there. Yeah, just tell everybody. If you've been at this webinar today, go out and tell everybody and spread the word. Because I loved Cicely's bit there about that unconscious bit. Um, we are all doing good, but we can do better. So my takeaway is put that green lens in your specs, in your glasses, and practice through that green lens. Every time you speak to someone about a medicine, think sustainability. Thank you so much, Sharon. And that is a reminder that this webinar will is recorded and is available to FIP members after the event. So please share this webinar. And there's been so much information presented today, you may want to go back and review it yourself. And Sanya, if you could tell us one thing for us as a call to action. Certainly. Um advocate for change, certainly um, go out there and, and even um, as small spheres, small steps, 
big steps wherever it is, advocate for change and to actually collaborate and share that information, whether it be in research or education, if you've got materials, please share because there's certainly a call to um, share as much of that information, especially where there's uncertainty and certainly in the legal framework, if you've got a system that works, please share. Thank you so much, Sanya. And I appreciate there is a few more questions that are still open in the chat, but for the sake of time, uh, our contact details or all the present uh, panelists' contact details are available. And I'm sure they're very friendly. Uh, if you reach out to them and send your questions through, I'm sure they'll respond. Thank you so much for our panelists. I will uh, like to briefly go back to close. Um, one final thing that you may wish to uh, go out, uh, see many familiar names in the academic section, uh, as well as the uh, ethics advisory group. Uh, there is a planetary health report card. The website is there uh, if you would wish to have a look. And this is actually, um, as Cicely said, future thinking. This is actually being uh, developed by the future generation. And that in this case is health professional students. Uh, they've established this in 2019 and it, every year they're seeking out health professional schools uh, and students from these schools to run a report on their curriculum. Are they learning about planetary health? Are they learning about sustainability? And get a report score and compare it across the world. And I've just put in a uh, X or uh, Twitter uh, post to say that I've got 213 schools signed up this year uh, across 18 countries and six disciplines, including pharmacy. So look out for that 2024 report that should be coming out later this year. So I would like to finish um, by, uh, I wish everybody to provide a virtual round of applause. Uh, Betty and I are most thankful that uh, all three uh, panellists agree to present. Uh, I'm sure you would agree that this has been a truly exciting session. It is a really important topic uh, and a increasingly important topic, not just for pharmacy, but also the wider healthcare uh, system. Please check out all future FIP digital events here. Uh, and I note that there are many attendees from the continent of Africa, which is fantastic, because in September 20, uh, this year, 1st to the 4th of September, our World Congress, the 82nd World Congress, will be in Cape Town, South Africa. So we warmly invite all attendees to attend our World Congress. And I look forward to seeing many of you there. So thank you all for attending and we look forward to seeing you either at Congress and other uh, webinars. And as Sharon has reminded us, so long and think of the fish. <laughs>